Hi, I'm Rashonda Kay. This is Reading with Rashonda. We are reading Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom by William and Ellen Craft. We are on part two, video five, and I think we're going to be able to finish today. So let's dive in. It was not until we stepped upon the shore at Liverpool that we were free from every slavish fear. We raised our thankful hearts to heaven and could have knelt down like the Neapolitan exiles and kissed the soil, for we felt that from slavery. Heaven sure had kept the spot of earth uncursed to show how all things were created first. In a few days after we landed, the Reverend Francis Bishop and his lady came and invited us to, their, to be their guests, to whose unlimited kindness and careful watch my wife owes in a great degree her restoration to health. We enclosed our letter from the Reverend Mr. May to Mr. Eslin, who at once wrote to invite us to his house at Bristol. On arriving there, both Mr. and Mrs. Eslin received us as cordially as did our first good Quaker friends in Pennsylvania. It grieves me much to have to mention that he is no more. Everyone who knew him can truthfully say, peace to the memory of a man of worth, a man of letters, and of manners too, of manners sweet as virtue always wears when gay good nature dresses her and smiles. It was principally through the extreme kindness of Mr. Eslin, the Right Honorable Lady Noel Bryan, Byron, Miss Harriet Martineau, Mrs. Reed, Miss Sturch, and a few other good friends that my wife and myself were able to spend a short time at a school in this country to acquire a little of that education which we were so shamefully deprived of while in the house of bondage. The school is under the supervision of the Mrs. Lushington DCL. During our stay at the school, we received the greatest attention from everyone, and I am particularly indebted to Thomas Wilson Esquire of Branmore House, Chiswick, who was then the master, for the deep interest he took in trying to get me on in my studies. We shall ever fondly and gratefully cherish the memory of our endeared and departed friend, Mr. Eslin. We, as well as the anti-slavery cause, lost a good friend in him. However, if departed spirits in heaven are conscious of the wickedness of this world and are allowed to speak, he will never fail to plead in the presence of the angelic host and before the great and just judge for downtrodden and outraged humanity. Therefore, I cannot think thee wholly gone. The better part of thee is with us still. Thy soul its hampering clay aside hath thrown and only freer wrestles with the ill. Thou livest in the life of all good things, what words thou sparkst for freedom shall not die. Thou sleepest not, for now thy love hath wings to soar where hence thy hope could hardly fly. Oh wow, that's beautiful. Thou livest in the life of all good things, so you're in heaven where everything is good. What words thou spakest for freedom shall not die. So everything he spoke about freedom isn't gonna die while he's in heaven. Thou sleepest not, for thy love hath wings to soar where hence thy hope could hardly fly. So it says he's not asleep. Um, it's saying he's not really dead because the love he showed to everyone now is soaring in heaven where, um, where before he couldn't even have hope. Wow, that was beautiful. And often from that other world, on this some gleams from great souls gone before may shine, to shed on struggling hearts a clearer bliss, and clothe the right with luster more divine. Farewell, good man, good angel now, this hand soon like thine own shall lose its cunning too. Soon shall this soul like thine, bewildered stand, then leap to thread the free unfathomed blue. So he's saying, um, like you, I'll die soon. I won't be able to write soon, but also like you, I will transcend and have the ultimate freedom. Nice. Um, that was apparently by James Russell Lowell. So it was a poem that he inserted in here. Um, that was by James Russell Lowell. In the preceding pages, I have not dwelt upon the great barbarities which are practiced upon the slaves because I wish to present the system in its mildest form and to show that the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. But I do now, however, most solemnly declare that a very large majority of the American slaves are overworked, underfed, and frequently unmercifully flogged. I have often seen slaves tortured in every conceivable manner I have seen him hunted down and torn by bloodhounds. 
I have seen them shamefully beaten and branded with hot irons. I have seen them hunted and even burned alive at the stake, frequently for offenses that would be applauded if committed by white persons for similar purposes. I mean, if we think of the American Revolution, they threw tea into a harbor. They were like, we're not following your laws. Give us liberty or give us death. And we applaud all of that. But had they been slaves, they would have been branded with hot irons, burned at the stake. I'll keep reading. In short, it is well known in England, if not all over the world, that the Americans as a people are notoriously mean and cruel towards all colored persons, whether they are bond or free. O oh, tyrant thou who sleepest on a volcano, from whose pent up wrath already some red flashes bursting up, beware. And that's the end. That isn't, <sighs> sorry, my candle lap is doing weird things. Okay, so let's look at how William and Ellen Craft ended this book. O oh, tyrant, thou who sleepest on a volcano, from whose pent up wrath already some red flashes bursting up, beware. So that vision of a tyrant sleeping on a volcano full of pent up wrath, and then saying beware, oh, that's powerful. So we could look at that a few ways. The tyrant could be emboldened by the force of the volcano it's sleeping on, except the very last word of the whole piece is beware. So that tyrant is sleeping on top of a volcano, a volcano of the downtrodden that will eventually erupt. And when it erupts, that tyrant needs to beware. Oh, tyrant who sleeps on top of a volcano and it said it was already gurgling and bubbling. That volcano is gonna blow and the downtrodden are gonna out that tyrant. The U.S. needed to hear that in the 1850s. The U.S. needs to hear that today. Oh, tyrant who's sleeping on top of a volcano, beware. Volcanoes are gonna do what they do. Eventually, people who are downtrodden are going to have had enough. They're going to get people rallying on their side and they're gonna blow. Oh, tyrant, beware. Wow, <laughs> that is such a powerful way to end their story. So that was Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom by William and Ellen Craft. I'm honestly not sure what we're gonna do next, but it'll be something. And I guess that's it for now. This is Reading with Rashonda. I'm Rashonda Cade.